we're going to begin in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And I tell you, I, I may just go ahead and mention this before we start. That, uh, that one of the things that about this, this time of year that I think is, is, is worthwhile is that uh, having to do with the reminder of the uh, supernatural element in, uh, in Christianity. And uh, by that I mean, of course, that uh, there are a lot of so-called Christians today that do not believe in a, a God that intervenes in a supernatural way. Um, of course, a lot of this is because they don't understand about rightly dividing the Word, that we live in a time where God isn't openly intervening in the physical world, even though I do believe that He does through prayer and a lot of times in an unseen way. I don't mean to suggest that he doesn't, but that in the sense of open and visible intervention, as in the days when he dealt with the nation of Israel and will again in the future. Uh, but so many Christians don't believe in that supernatural element. They, to them, Christianity is just a, a moral philosophy or you know, just a way to, to live. Uh, and, and it's no different from Buddhism or Islam, and it's probably why so many so-called Christians gravitate away from Christianity. But, but the, the, the manger scene is what I have in mind mostly, and contemplating the manger scene, because there are two elements about it that, that, that uh, about the supernatural with God the Father. And of course, one being the, the virgin birth. The testimony to the virgin birth that 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 God uh, found a, a a means of of being born and coming into his own, his creation that which was made by the Word as it, in John chapter one and Colossians chapter one and uh, manifested His glory manifested His his uh, all of his holy attributes, his deity was manifested in, in his life, and yet having manifested that deity, take on the sins of the of the of a rebellious world that had turned their back on him and allowed him himself to be crucified by sinful men, pay for their sins, and then rise from the dead. The, and it's interesting to, to, as I say, just contemplate these things and notice how many times these things are together in the Scripture. But the testimony, and I believe it just centers there in that manger scene of the virgin birth, the sign of the virgin birth, and then the sign of the resurrection from the dead and the testimony to His eternal power and Godhead by those means. So we're reading Luke chapter 2 from verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And you'll notice the, the word espoused being included there. Uh, we'll see other passages that Mary was promised to him. They had already, as they used to say in Old England, entered into an understanding. But they had not yet come together. And so she was promised to him. And yet, uh, that, so the scripture is very clear that Mary was his espoused wife, being great with child. Verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And by the way, you know, there's another thing I want to throw this in for I skip over it and forget about it, that one of the things that's so marvelous, as I say, about contemplating these things in the manger scene and it's the thing that's really so affecting about it is how lowly he became, how, how he humiliated himself, not just to be born into the, his creation, but in, in such a manner as that he made himself, as it says in Philippians, of no reputation. I mean, uh, if we had planned all these things out, we would have had the, 
the, the best doctor in Bethlehem tending to Mary, you know, at the best hospital. And, uh, and, and when he's born, I make sure that all of the, the, the dignitaries were there to... But it wasn't that way at all. And, and, and of course, even in all these things, disregarding the appearance of the star, which evidently no one around Judea paid any attention to at all. And yet the wise, those wise men of the East, having, I believe having inherited the, some things from Daniel, uh, knew something about the star when they saw it. But he, he became lowly. And it, so here you see the lowliness of this aspect, this, uh, this announcement that was made only to these shepherds. So verse 8, it said, And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, the, uh, whether or not this is what the Spirit intended when he said that the, the sign, pertaining to the sign uh, of the babe in the manger there, whether, it, whether the, he really intended for the swaddling clothes to be a sign, nevertheless there it is. I believe that there is a sign there pertaining to the, the swaddling clothes. And we're going to come back to Luke 2, but not immediately. So if you want to keep a finger there, we'll get back there in just a few minutes. But I want you to notice in Matthew 27... Matthew 27, and in verse 57, it said, When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body... He wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And now, so you see there that, that to, to us anyway, I mean, in a certain sense, there's a, there's a sign of his, why he came into the world. It's when he was born, they wrapped his body. Uh, when he dies, he, they take him from the cross and they wrap him in the same uh, linen cloth. It, it's, a, it's a sign of, of why he came into his creation. Uh, in fact, notice over at John, John 20, In John 20, from verse 1, John 20, verse 1, he says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Now, uh, you know, without being controversial about it, I rather suspect that what 
Peter saw when he went and looked. When he looked, when it says that he found the napkin wrapped and placed by itself, saw the linen clothes lie, that what he saw were the clothes with no one in them. In other words, I, I don't believe it would have been with the Lord as it was when he uh, called forth Lazarus and, and Lazarus came forth from the tomb and he told the people that stood by, loose him and let him go. I don't believe the Lord had to be loosed. I believe that he came in, 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 resurre in his resurrection body came through the clothes, in other words, and, the, and that the clothes just remained wrapped but empty. <coughs> and, you know, uh, down through the years I've thought about the similarity there as far as it being a picture in nature where the, a caterpillar, which looks just like a worm, which the Lord says that's what we are by nature. And, that when, and so when Christ is hanging on the cross and he's quoting Psalm 22 and he says, I... I am a worm and no man. In other words, he's becoming that that we are by nature. He took upon himself that which we are. And so that caterpillar begins to spin that cocoon around himself and goes to sleep as a, you know, a picture there. And then, of course, has to come out of it. But he comes and he doesn't look anything like a worm anymore. He's a beautiful Butterfly, and it's just so amazing about God having put that little testimony there to uh, the resurrection and how glorious the resurrection body is. Then, uh, so, but but he's this. There he is. He's born, and they wrap him in the same linen cloth whereby they take him down from the cross and wrap him when he dies. Uh, Look in Philippians 2, and as I say, we'll go back to Luke in just a minute, but go to Philippians 2, and if you can manage, you can go ahead and get 1 Timothy chapter 1. Philippians 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 1. And in Philippians 2, we'll read from verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him in resurrection, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, you know, you see it's not exactly obvious there, but in that passage you have those two elements. In, in the passage you have the virgin birth, in that he was thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men. And then that God hath highly exalted him, that is in resurrection. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And he says from verse 12, Paul says of himself, 1 Timothy 1 verse 12, he said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him 
to life everlasting. You see, I, I, there's something about that, uh, per, that perception of how much he humiliated himself, how much he uh, made himself of no reputation. That, uh, and, and, and then that put alongside what Paul saw himself to be. You know, a blasphemer, injurious, a persecutor, all these things. That, that, that the, the more a person perceives those, those things, the more of an effect it has on his soul and in his heart to, to motivate us to love. You know, I, I've been thinking about this kind of thing quite a bit lately for some reason. I don't really know. It seem, might seem like a simple thing. But in, in Romans chapter 5, I believe it's the fifth verse there, Paul said uh, that, uh, that the love of God is shed abroad by our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And, uh, I mean, I noticed that a long time ago that, I, you know, people talk about loving God, but it's, uh, it's very clear there that unless a person's truly saved by the grace of God, he can't. Because we, we really, by nature, can't love God. We, we, we come into the world with a nature that's enmity. Paul said the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And for the most part, we spend most of our lives being totally unaware of that. That by nature, we, we're at enmity with Him. But, but being saved, and that and being uh, brought down and seeing the, you know, the need of salvation and then having the, the answer to our problem being presented to us in the gospel, then that we, we can experience that love, but it's based upon that, that that He gives us. It's by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And so I don't believe it's necessarily wrong to ask the Lord that you might love Him more. I mean, of, of all of the things that, that we're privileged to, to know and experience, I don't know of anything any better than that, is, is to, to have that experience, that true love of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in our hearts. So, you know, contemplating the manger scene, I believe, is part of that. Uh, go back to Luke 2 now. And it's just interesting to notice how from the very start that the Holy Ghost was very careful to maintain the truth of Christ's virgin birth. I mean, we were just read there and in, the, in Luke chapter 2 about the, the circumstances of His birth. And by the way, I'm going to just throw this in. I uh, came across some information recently and I, I believe there's a lot of, probably a lot of truth in it that... Uh, because that Luke said that he received his information in the very first passage in Luke, Luke chapter 1, from those that were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word, that the details of chapter 1 and chapter 2 that are included in his book that are not in any of the other books, so-called Gospels, that he received from Mary. That, that, and obviously, there wouldn't be a greater eyewitness of those things than Mary. And I believe there's a, there's a great possibility that that's true. But of course, the, uh, and the devil has been busy down through the years to try to mar this truth. So notice like how, you know, that in Luke 2 verse 33 is one of the verses that's almost always perverted in the other versions. So that you find there in Luke 2 verse 33, said, And Joseph... And his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Well, notice how this continues, though. Uh, come to verse 40. Verse 40 says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So you see the emphasis very careful 
to refer to Joseph and his mother. And of course they find him and uh, there and uh, discoursing with the doctors. Anyway, verse 48, it says that when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? <laughs> and he's not in there discussing carpentry, you know. Verse 50, And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. See, there's things, phrases like that that suggest that, those, that that really was a great possibility that Luke received the information from her. Verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Look back in chapter 1. While you're here in Luke. Luke 1. And, of course, uh, it was almost certainly at the time of the summer solstice, at the end of June, when uh, John the Baptist was conceived. At the end, Zacharias uh, saw the angel in the, the temple. Uh, and verse 23 says, just read with me, we're going to read a good bit of this passage. Luke 1 verse 23 says, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And of course, it's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, not the sixth month of the year. And so if we would count, you know, from, uh, so if the, from the end of June to the end of July would be one month. The end of uh, August, September, October, November, December. So this is the end of December. As a matter of fact, I, I, we didn't mention this, I don't think, last in the class last time, but I, in John chapter 1, I've always believed there are two things that are referred to. In John chapter 1, he says that the Word was made flesh, and I believe that that is a reference to his conception at the end of December. He said the Word was made flesh and dwelt, which word means tabernacle, you know, at the end of September, around the 29th most likely, sometime, maybe the beginning of October. Then those things vary as we talked about. But those two things see the end of passage. So that both Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 are significant. One is having to do with when he was made flesh. The other having to do with his birth and tabernacling them among them there. And uh, how that you can even count the days. And they're exactly 280 days, you know, for... Uh, uh, for Mary to have carried the Lord. So anyway, verse 26 again, Luke 1 verse 26, said, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. See, there's the word espoused again. Of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. For behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And I might mention, you'll notice that there, I believe there's more going on here about the house of David than just talking about their genealogy. It, it's, it, there's a significance in these things, and we'll touch on it as we go along. Verse 33 says, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, 
and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also a conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days, didn't let the time pass, and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So there's no doubt about it. The Lord is present there. And you know, I've, I've mentioned before, I, I enjoy some of the Christmas songs. And by the way, that's another thing about it, you know, whether people pay any attention to it or not, there is that testimony, you know, you, round yon virgin mother and child. It's testimony to the virgin. But uh, I, I like the song, Oh Holy Night, you know. And in my mind, you know, I just adjust it a little and that's where I put it. In other words, I believe that it has, it has to do with that, that time. And it would have been the darkest time of the year. And of course, you know too how that the signs cor correspond where John was born or rather conceived at, at the summer solstice when the sun decreases from that point throughout the year. And Christ conceived at the winter solstice when the sun increases. And so John said of himself, well, that he must increase, but I must decrease. And it's even, even that that shows up in those signs. But... Uh, so the, here's the, uh, the testimony to the fact that life begins at conception and the Lord is there. He had been made flesh. He was already in His creation. And just while we're here, just notice uh, that down in verse 56 that says that, And Mary abode with her, that is her cousin Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her own house. It indicates that she stayed there with her until John was born, you see. So, by the time that she goes home, go to, I want you to go to Matthew 1 and take uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Matthew 1 and in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 7. Now in Matthew 1, from verse 18, Matthew 1 verse 18, he says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. And you know, you have to just stop and just think soberly and with a spiritual mind about those things. Uh, I susp in my first impression was I suspect he was broken hearted. You know. And... Uh, but that he's a he's a tender hearted person, obviously, and uh he's not sure what to do uh because he's Mary has been away for three months and now she's home and uh she's with child and yet verse twenty uh, and and uh, and I might also add there that in He's uh, um, basically under the law, too, according to Deuteronomy. We won't go into that right now. But, but verse 20, he says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. 
And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So you see Joseph acting in faith there, and uh, um, I've started, I thought just left my mind as quickly as it came in, <laughs> but. Uh, He's, of course, he says, notice he says, of the house of David. Uh, look at Isaiah 7, which, of course, is the, the passage that's being quoted. In Isaiah 7, verse 10, he said, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now there's something going on here, and I hope I don't get too far off track, but it might help you to understand that this man Ahaz is not a, a really, his heart is not really right with God. He, he tends toward idolatry. And uh, the idea of him being presented with the choice of asking for a sign and him saying, oh, I, no, I won't ask a sign. It's not an indication of his spirituality. It's an indication of his lack of it. He, uh, you know, no, I don't want God to give me a sign. And what, so, the, I said there's so many things that are going on at different levels because he turns out to have a son, Hezekiah, who is sick. And God sends Isaiah to him to tell him, get your house in order because you're not going to live. And Hezekiah was broken hearted about it. And Isaiah left and it says he turned his face to the wall and prayed. Just the Lord was to remember. And uh, so the Lord spoke to Isaiah on his way out and basically said to turn around. I've decided to, to spare him. And he added 15 years to his life. So uh, uh, Isaiah comes in and he says that uh, the Lord is going to heal you. Uh, ask a sign. Uh, do you want me to go? Do you want the sun to go forward 10 degrees? Do you want it to go backwards 10 degrees? And Hezekiah said, "Well, it's a small thing for it to go uh, forward 10 degrees. Make it go backwards 10 degrees." <laughs> I mean, just the contrast of it all. I mean, you know, here this one guy says, I won't, don't, uh, don't give me a sign. And here Hezekiah is, is, accepts it, you know, from the same prophet, Isaiah. And uh, now we'll bring this up again and again in a minute. But anyway, verse 13, and he says, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you, will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call His name Emmanuel. You see, the sign really is to the house of David. And it's not an, it's, it's not an insignificant thing. Uh, which the passage is quoted, you know, in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, go to the Psalms. In fact, if you want to go ahead and turn, you can get Psalm 110 uh, in one hand. Psalm 110 and get Acts chapter 2.
Psalm 110 and Acts chapter 2. And uh, it, in Psalm 110, we have a verse that the Lord Himself presented to the Pharisees and kind of asked them that as a riddle, and they couldn't answer Him. Psalm 110, uh, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And by the way, you'll notice the, little, the uh, uh, superscription there, to a Psalm of David. So this, David said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And all those things are kind of related there together, but we're interested in first verse 1, that the, the Lord, David said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Before we go to Acts 2, look at Psalm 132. Psalm 132, uh, verse 8. Psalm 132, verse 8. He says, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Now, I, I, I realize I, I probably haven't put things together very well. But God had promised to David, of the fruit of your body will I set upon thy throne. Therefore, David could say, the Lord said unto my Lord. In other words, that it would be born through his lineage. Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord has sworn unto David. So that the sign was to the house of David, you see, it, in that uh, we've seen that over and over, Mary and Joseph of the... In fact, I, I, I believe that they're cousins. And I believe he's a generation older. And it's interesting, you don't find much said about... Evidently, by the time the Lord was crucified, I believe Joseph had died. But uh, because he's just not mentioned. Now that doesn't, I mean, that's the most likely thing. But, uh, but the, and, and again, this is where that thing with Hezekiah comes in. If you notice up at, in, uh, right up under the number of the psalm, it says, you see what it's called? A song of degrees. There are 15 psalms that are called psalms of degrees, the songs of degrees. Of the 15 years that were added to Hezekiah's life when he brought the degrees of the the sundial t backwards 10 degrees. Uh, I believe there are well uh, I believe there are 10 that are that are his. There's two that are David's. There's, I'm sorry I, I've got, I, don't, I don't have it exactly laid out in my head. Some of them are, are identified there. But the thing that's so marvelous is that that thing that I just, was just referring to where Hezekiah was sick and Isaiah told him he was going to die. At that point, he had not had a child. So that when Hezekiah is praying, he's praying because he knows that if he dies, God's promise is broken because there's no son. So that when, when he writes this as a song of his degrees, he's rejoicing. And when he says he will not turn from it, he's speaking from experience because he's, he's healed, he has a son, and without going into his moral character, which turns out to be not very good, but nevertheless, the, the line was perpetuated. It was according to his promise unto the house of David. So that the sign 
of, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne was confirmed there in Matthew chapter 1 when it's uh, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth the son. Anyways, all those things come in there together and, and fit. So this, you know, the testimony to the virgin birth is just overwhelming. And you'll notice how both of these things come in when Peter preached in Acts 2. If you'll look there. In Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2 verse 29. He said, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so there we have again another passage that has the testimony of the virgin birth woven in together with the resurrection. And it's like that you see without one, the, the other... It doesn't have meaning. It, in other words, if, if, if Christ was born of a virgin and yet didn't rise from the dead, then, then he would have had a miraculous life, but there would have been no, no benefit for us. But once again, if he had risen from the dead and yet not been born of a virgin, he would not be a sufficient sacrifice. His, he, he would be of our, a sinner born from Adam. And... Who's, he could not pay for anyone's sins. He, he, did, he would not have any, any offering to offer. Uh, look at John 17 and just a few other things, just a few other incidental passages. But In John 17, From verse 1, John 17, verse 1, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Uh, by the way, you know, I've, I've thought a couple of times today in looking over the passages and preparing for the class, and it wasn't because of this, but I was remembering uh, a class or two ago, was it Ellie? Oh, yeah. Had asked me a question. She said, well, she wanted to, and I may not have to be putting it just exactly right, but she wanted to know, was God born? Was God born? And I told her, well, at my aunt, I mean, you know, that little kid puts you on the spot, you know. <laughs> and I said, well, the, 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 the man through, how we know him that was born, but he was before he was born. I might have said he existed before he was born. And it's amazing. She, she understood the wow of that, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, wow. I mean, and I, I'm really surprised that a child of that, of that age answer, asking a question like that. And that. But that's one of those things that, that, that our intellect can't grasp. I mean, uh, we, uh, 
and 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 all of the the fa all of these things that we're talking about about and considering that the 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 babe in the manger, uh, how that God's eternal power and glory and omnipotence and 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 uh, and yet come into the world and become humiliated and have to depend on sinners to feed him and care for him and put and there's something a parallel here I think as far as the word of God is concerned really because you know it 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 came into the world through the instrumentality of sinners holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and yet God entrusted the keeping of that of his holy son and says he trusted the keeping of his holy word uh, unto, and there's something that's just mysterious about all that there's no there's no arriving at a, a, a an understanding of it it's just something that we you know that I believe that the Lord intended to be for us to wonder and, and marvel about and uh, and it's a testimony to his goodness and grace uh, look at John chapter 20 while you're in John In John 20, verse 26, it says, And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. He said, My Lord and my God. Uh, go to Acts 20, and once more get to go to 1 Timothy, and we'll stop with these two passages, for Acts 20 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. And as, just as we were saying about Luke chapter 2 verse 33, the, uh, where the, uh, so many of the so-called versions have uh, Joseph be uh, his father his, uh, and uh, muddle up the, the truth of the virgin birth, there are two other passages that are almost always mistranslated. One of them here is in Acts 20, where Paul is meeting with the leaders of the church at Ephesus. This is the last time he's going to see them, he says. Uh, and he says in verse uh, 26, we'll just start from there, Acts 20, verse 26. He says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the Lord Jesus Christ's blood was of course not from Adam. It was from God the Father. It was pure, sinless, holy blood and of infinite value so that it could cover the sins of you and me and a limitless number. There would be never an end to the number of people that could be saved and whose sins could be covered by that blood. And, uh, you know, there's, and the will, Lord willing, we'll talk about this in, in view of the little paper that came in the mail that we were talking a little bit about with the denying that there's any hell. You know, there's a difference between condemnation and wrath. The, in the book of John, it says that he that believeth on the Son hath life. He, you know, but said that if uh, he that believeth not the Son is condemned already. Men are born condemned. But when men reject the remedy for the condemnation, that's when God's wrath is kindled. You see, there's a difference between just, con just condemnation, which we didn't choose, and wrath, which could be avoided, and, and yet men don't, you know. But nevertheless, it was, the, it was the blood, God's own blood. Now, in 1 Timothy 3, 
In this passage, you would really be amazed how it is messed up. But in 1 Timothy 3, from verse 14. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14. He says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. I mean, just as plain as it could be said, God was manifest in the flesh. And so the, these other translations have things saying like, He who was made manifest in the flesh. And what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they, but they, it's, it's like they just will not, they will not confess that He was born of a virgin. They will not confess... And, and it's, it, there's certain passages where things are left alone, but you can generally go to those Luke chapter 2, verse 33, Acts chapter 20, and 1 Timothy 3, and they're never left alone. They're always changed because the Holy Spirit was very clear about Christ being born of a virgin, and uh, he, he was indeed God manifest in the flesh. So, uh, you know, when you think about the babe in the manger, Remember those two things, the sign of the virgin birth and the fact that he's wrapped in the swaddling clothes. He's God manifest in the flesh, but who came into his creation to be shed his own blood, as he said in Acts 20, to redeem us unto himself, uh, that we might be with him forever and know the love of, of God and have fellowship with him and uh, be delivered from the wrath to come.